Well, good evening. How y'all doing tonight? All right. Well, if you have a Bible, and you should, we can go to first to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Get it right there. And we're going to look first in verse 14. Now, in what we're going to be doing tonight, is we're going to be, of course, continuing on about what took place at that new birth. But i got to admit, we're recognizing the fact that we're in a Salvation Army church, doing the best I can not just to take off on William Booth and just talk about some things here because <laughs> he is definitely one of my top heroes. Uh, what he accomplished was just absolutely amazing. And the fact that his work is still carrying on uh, is a, just a tribute to the force of will that he put toward it in line with God's will and what was accomplished through this. And now, <clears throat> through the years, um, I was reading the, the thing up there that said no tea or coffee, and I thought, I remembered back about his life and one day out of every year and then actually one week out of every year they would actually uh, set aside because of course tea and coffee were the big things of their day and they would say we're going to take a week here and we're not going to drink any tea or coffee and the money we would spend on tea and coffee we're going to give toward the saving of souls and every dollar that came in William Booth and of course his wife Catherine was the, the mighty force behind him uh, most, almost all of his sermons were actually written by her. And then he basically just read them. And, but she was the, the powerhouse behind it. And they called every dollar that was given in donation during that week uh, a cartridge, a bullet, to be used toward the war against sin and deprivation and degradation of mankind. So uh, if you want a, one of the most inspiring stories you'll ever read, uh, read the life story of William Booth. There's several of them out there. Roy Hattersley wrote one uh, on what they called uh, Blood and Fire or something like that. And then um, the other guy recently, uh, Yaxton, Trevor Yaxton, Yaxley, Yaxton, Yaxley, something like that. Anyway, he wrote one. <laughs> and any of those books are good. Uh, books on John Wesley, another one. Uh, at some point, The church is going to have to get the fire. Especially, I mean, even the, the very sign, going right back to William Booth again, their, their motto is blood and fire. And at some point, the church is going to have to get off of the idea that it's all about the preachers. The preachers are the trainers. We're the coaches. We're to, we're to get you in the game. As long as you're sitting on the bench, you're not in the game. We got to get you off the bench and into the game. That's our job. And somewhere you have to get a hold of the fact of what you truly have. And if you ever get a hold of that, what was actually done in you and what you truly have, and the cost that was paid to get it to you, both by Jesus, first of all, but also by every person along the way that continued carrying the message of the gospel. And if you ever get a hold of that, you'll become a soul winner. You will become a person who... You know, it's not just about another experience or another service. Uh, tonight we're going to read a scripture here in just a moment where Paul was telling them to greet the people, the church, which is in this person's house. The church which was in his house. See, the church is the group. He, he didn't say greet the people in the church house. He said greet the church that was in, meeting in the house. And every reference to, uh, to the church in the New Testament almost is, goes back to a church that was meeting in the house. And the main reason was, of course, is they didn't have their own temples, they didn't have their own buildings. But the focus also wasn't, was the fact that they weren't about buildings, they were about souls. So the reason we're doing this seminar is because you have to realize Jesus never taught healing. He never taught healing. He explained it sometimes. But he never taught it. He just said, do it. 
everything he taught went back to having union with God and being thankful that God extended his hand to create that union. Religion is man trying to climb the ladder to get himself to God. Christianity is Jesus coming down and bringing us union with God. That's the difference. So it's not about us achieving. It's about us awakening to what has already been done. Awake to the righteousness which is in Christ Jesus, which is in you. So we're going to look at, at, at this tonight. You should be at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Paul says, and of course, the hardest thing for me is just to start anywhere because it's all good and I keep wanting to go back to, you know, 13, 12, 10, and yeah, boy, let's just go back to chapter 1. I mean, it's just all good. <clears throat> but we are on a limited time schedule, so we're going to jump in here. Now, the, what that means is I don't ever expect you to just take my word for it. And I don't ever expect you to just believe that I'm keeping it in context. I expect you to go home and you go back from verse 14 back to, you know, the beginning of the chapter and you read it. Make sure it's in context. That's your job, all right? I, I'm, I make sure it is, but I, if you're going to leave it to me and trust me to do it, you're putting a whole lot in my hands. You understand that? It's important. This is talking about your eternity. It's talking about your walk with God. You should be investigating this stuff. So, verse 14. Paul says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom... The world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So that's the first step. You've got to realize and reckon, this is a typical word used in the King James, that you are crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to you. That means that it is dead to you, and it represents something horrific. Not just, well, I shouldn't do that because it's not right. No, sin is bondage. It, it It's... It's a trap. So it is something that you have to reckon yourself dead to. Now, verse 15, and this is what I referred back to last night. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Now, do you hear what that's saying? Circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. Keeping the law is not keeping the law. Doing everything like you're supposed to or not doing everything. All that counts is the new man. Now, if you are a new man, if you are truly born again, then yeah, it is going to create a change, a ripple effect throughout your entire life that's going to go all the way back to sin and to your actions. It's going to change you. But Jesus did not come and die so that you could be the next employee of the month. Right? That's not his purpose. His purpose was to separate you from sin so that you don't have to die in your sins. Amen? So now watch. He says, And as many as walk according to this rule. Hear that? There's a rule. One of the things, even now, that we're going to have to be very careful about as we hear it. I, I believe, obviously, in grace, but at the same time, you sometimes have to have definitions. Because... Through the years, the church is very consistent at going from one extreme to the other. All right? That's what they do. A doctrine comes out, a teaching, a revelation from God. And you'll have people that run to the opposite extremes on either side, and then the church will swing between the two. You know? Part of it is, oh, it's all by works. Everything is works, work. You've got to get there. You've got to do this. You've got to do everything just right. You've got to follow everything just right. And then it'll swing to the other side of grace. Oh, there are no rules. There's nothing. I can live any way I want to live. And I can tell you right now, I live exactly the way I want to live. I don't desire to sin. You understand? I, 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 we were talking the other day. A guy was telling me, we were talking about some people that they knew they'd been witnessing to. And the guy... His friend drank and they smoked and they did everything that the church has typically uh, pointed the finger at and said, you can't do that. And he, he was, we were talking about it and he said, you know, what do I tell this guy? I said, what? Tell him what I tell him. He said, what's that? I said, I tell him I drink all the alcohol I want to. I smoke all the cigarettes I want to. I said, but the thing is, I don't want to. So therefore, I don't do any of it. Right? But I don't not do it so that I can be saved. You see? I, I don't want to do it because I'm saved. See the difference? That's how you can tell that there has to be this heart thing that takes place. 
and I want to emphasize this because here we are talking about the new man. That's the whole purpose of this entire seminar. Now that means that there has to be something that Christianity cannot just be a change of ideas. You know, for instance, when I was growing up in my early 20s and beginning into my 30s, uh, mid 30s or so, I was heavily into martial arts. I taught martial arts. I studied it, lived it, breathed it. I mean, that was that was what I was into. Well, Christianity is different. Now, I, I live it, I breathe it, I study, I, you know, it's, it's, I'm doing, I am as adamant and as obsessed with it as I was martial arts, and in most ways even more so. You know, the difference is, my heroes now, I don't idolize. Whereas when I was in martial arts, I idolized them. But the difference is also, is that the whole time, somebody would ask me, say, you know, well, I'm into cars. I'm into boats, I'm into fishing, well, I'm into martial arts. Okay, but we're not into Christianity. You see what I'm saying? It's not a hobby. It's not, it's not even just a mental change of trying to live right. A lot of people can reform themselves, right? People quit smoking every day and it has nothing to do with God, right? You know, people quit drinking every day and it has nothing to do with God. What we're talking about is something that takes place. Now, I'm not going to get graphic or any of that kind of stuff, but the closest thing that it comes to, and Jesus used the term, the new birth. So the closest thing that we have to relate it to is when a woman is pregnant. There are people around the world that engage in, in sexual intercourse, and yet life is not produced. But then, then there is those times during that physical act that a life is created. One second, it's not there. The next second, it is. In a split second, life is created. That's Christianity. In a split second, life is generated within yourself. Right? Why? Because you have submitted yourself to God, given yourself to Him, and He makes a change take place in you where you are born again. And that, born, that new birth is a new creature. It's not just turning over a new leaf. It's not a new resolution, right? You don't get saved every January 1st, all right? You have to realize there is something that actually takes place in the spirit. Now, again, and, you know, people could argue back and forth on this, but there, technically, you know, physiologically, there should be no way for a woman to know the second she's pregnant, technically, all right? But many times they do, and they can tell you, I, I know I'm pregnant. You know, have you had any tests? No, I hadn't taken any tests, hadn't been to the doctor, but I just know, you know. And sometimes other people can tell it too. They look at them and say, there's something different about you. you. You just, there's a glow, there's something about it. Well, I don't know what it is. Even they don't know. But then they find out they're pregnant. So sometimes you can have something like that happen, and you don't even know it. But other times you are sensitive enough to it that you don't know what it is, but you know something happened. Well, it is similar in the spirit that when you are born again, there is something that takes place in you. You know, you might know something happened. I mean, obviously, if you give your heart to Jesus and you confess him as Lord, you know you did that, right? It, it, he didn't sneak up on you and, you know, trick you. And then he didn't have somebody standing outside over the doorway with a bucket of water to baptize you when you walked through, you know? <laughs> he, he didn't do that, all right? You had to consent to it. But what I'm saying is that you might not know what happened. You know, you know you were born again. You know you gave your heart to Christ. But you might not know how that happened and what all that entails. That's why Paul wrote his epistles. So that you could find out what are the riches that are in Christ Jesus. And the riches that are in him are not things. They are the union that we have with him. And the things that took place in us. And we have to realize, now, this is going to sound strange because some of the best books that even talk about this, it's kind of funny because there's like two major differences. You've got some of the old line, I'm talking about in the early 1900s, late 1800s, what uh, at that time denominationally would have been along the lines of, say, like the Baptist, because they, they were, you know, that's what, that was their emphasis. And then, as we were just talking in the back there, that 
you know, John Wesley came along and, and at that time the new birth was vitally important, but in many ways to them at that point, it was just a change of lifestyle. You know, you went to church, you lived a good life, uh, you paid money for the pew you sat on. You know, they called it pew rent. They actually rented the pews. And, and you would rent the pew for your whole family. And the wealthier you were, the closer you were to the front. It was a status thing. Right? I mean, <laughs> so, but that's the way they did things. And, they, and people looked and said, well, he's got to be a good churchman. He's got to be a good Christian. You know, he's on the third row. I mean, he's, I mean, he's almost up to the front. You know, it was like a rank and a promotion. You know, but we have to realize that it's not just being a good person. You know, now if you're a Christian, you'll be a good person, but being a good person doesn't make you a Christian. Right? Does that make sense to you? So whenever you start looking at these things, I want you to know what took place. And as we look at this, the thing to remember is, is this. The, the, again, I'm emphasizing this over. This is not something that you're going to get. We're not talking about when you get to heaven. We're talking about what took place in your life the second you said, Jesus, you're my Lord. The second, as we would say, the second you said, I do, this is what happened, right? So I'm trying to reveal to you, and the, the scriptures tell us very clearly what happened during that time. And so we're going to go through these. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover. And, I, and a couple of things, because I know, I mean, I, I was looking through this today. I have a lot of scriptures here. There's actually 92 pages of nothing but scripture. Not, no notes, no comments, just scripture, right? So there's a lot there. Now, I don't have this manual for you uh, because it's not broken down. Again, it's just scripture, and I didn't come here just to sell it. But I will tell you this. If you would like, because one of the things, let me say it this way. Remember last night when I was talking about the mind renewal that I'm looking at? It's going to work, right? Because every, I'm, I'm taking it straight out of the Bible. Well, everything that the Bible says about having your spirit renewed, your, the, the spirit of your mind renewed, having your mind renewed, what to do, how to do it, all these aspects. So, it, I mean, it's just, it's not some weird, you know, science uh, fiction thing, all right? This, it's just what the Bible says. Now, the more I study this and what it says about it, the more... I'm reminded of things in science that verifies it, right? So that's always a good thing, but I don't, I don't go by that. But when you notice things that line up, you can say, well, that's, that's neat, you know? And so what I'm doing, <clears throat> didn't plan this, but I was walking and praying some today, and I really thought about, I believe this would be a good time to do this. If, now, this, I'm not talking about a program that you join and, it costs you money. I'm not talking about that, all right? If, if I put this thing together and it's, you know, in a, in a system, so to speak, I guess, you know, like a, like a DHD seminar, that kind of thing, if we did something like that and it works, how many of you would be interested in it? Okay, okay. Then just let, let me tell you this. Part of the process is, you know, we've always heard the saying, repetition is the mother of memory right? That is true. But at the same time, part of the key to it, just if you've ever gone through any college courses or, or even just school, and you're going to take a test, and you've been goofing off, and you, you want to cram for the test. Well, how many of you know that cramming doesn't work? It works temporarily. You may make a good score, but you're going to forget what you crammed, right? You're going to forget that Within three or four days, you're going to forget it. After the test, you, make a, you may make a good score in the test, but you will forget it because it was not committed to long-term memory. It was short-term memory. So the key to memory, and I'm not talking about memorization. I'm not even talking about that. That's a whole other thing, and memorization does not renew your mind. Right? we got people out there that can quote the Bible from Genesis to the book of the Revelation, and their mind is not renewed. Okay? My mother's parrot quotes the Bible. Right, and that bird's mind is not renewed. I guarantee you. Right. <clears throat> so, the reason I'm saying this is because there is a an aspect of repetition, but it's not saying it a thousand times a day. 
it's spaced repetition, but at the same time, the key is exactly what Solomon said. And all you're getting, get understanding. So for you to really renew the mind, you're, you not only have to know the scripture and what it says, but you have to understand it. When you put the understanding with the scripture, then that creates memory, but it also creates, and well, it's, it's, it's actually threefold. It's amazing how everything runs back to three. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, all that kind of thing. But the three parts are, number one, you have to have the repetition, right? You have to have the scripture and the, the understanding of scripture joined with it. But then the third thing is to renew the mind has to be tied to doing. You actually have to do it, right? You can read every book on riding a bicycle. You can watch people ride a bicycle. But until you ride a bicycle, you don't know how to ride a bicycle. Right? You might even know it well enough to teach people how to ride a bicycle, and you may have never been on a bicycle yourself. Right? That's what's happened in a lot of church over the last 2,000 years, is we've had people teach things they'd never experienced. Right? And because of that, theory gets involved. Well, <coughs> what I'm willing to do, <coughs> and I don't know how I'm going to do this yet, okay? but then I never know how I'm going to do anything until we do it anyway. So <coughs> this is kind of standard for me. Instead of selling you a manual, which we could have done, we could have put it together and sold them. You know, they, you wouldn't have thought anything about it because it's normal. Instead of doing that, <clears throat> if you want to participate in this program, if we have a, a, a thing I'm going to pass out later, if you want to get involved, and actually we would like it if you even if you don't want to get involved, we'd still like you to fill this out. <clears throat> but what I want to do is, if you fill this out and you're interested, and in, I want you to put on there that you're interested in the the you know, mind renewal program or something like that. Just mention that aspect. And then if you give us your email, now listen, if you give me your email, nobody else is going to get it. I don't sell it to anybody. Don't give it to anybody. <clears throat> we won't ever write you asking for money. We don't do that. All right? It is for me to help you, not for me to get from you. If I get your email, it's for me to give you something, not for me to get something from you. Do you understand that? I'm making that very blunt. You see, I'm saying this publicly, all right? So there's no way I can back off of it. I want to make sure you understand that. But if you sign up for this, then we will find a way. It may take me a little bit of time to figure out the best way to do it, but we will find a way to institute through the email to involve you in this mind renewal program. Right? Because what I will be doing is I will send you out. That can't be right construction grammatically. <clears throat> I will send out to you, okay, <clears throat> periodically at varying stages in time, materials to help renew your mind and it will give you the scripture it'll tell you what to do it'll take you through it it might be fairly short sometimes it might be longer and then it will tell you the action to accompany it that will lock this thing in and by following this program the, now the good thing is the only thing I would hope to get back from you would be reports on how it's working All right that would be it so knowing that now how many of you would like to participate good deal alright because you're going to be my guinea pigs Okay? <laughs> you notice I didn't say that. I didn't tell you that part until after you raised your hand. <clears throat> but, but we will, I, I'm really serious about this. I'm absolutely convinced that God never intended, as I said last night, for it to take 20, 30, 40 years for us to renew our minds. The world needs Jesus now. Right? Doesn't need to, for us to be sitting and waiting for 30 years before we get, you know, some little part of Jesus showing up. We've got, this has to work, and all I'm doing is going in the Bible, and you'll see, just like everything else we do, it is scripture, scripture, scripture. Amen? Now, in the process of that, you'll be getting this manual. <clears throat> because I, I really believe that God has tied these two things together, both the new man and renewing the mind, obviously, because they're one and the same. Okay? <clears throat> now, that being the case, then you will be getting the manual, and we won't be charging you for it. Right? We'll just send it out to you. <clears throat> excuse me, piece by piece, so to speak, <clears throat> over time. But the good thing is, that way you won't, um, you won't get ahead of yourself. See, the, one of the worst things about <clears throat> churchianity is that you come to church every Sunday, and the minister has to have, generally speaking, the minister has to have something new and fresh and exciting, and <clears throat> you know, because you, you don't want to hear the same thing over and over again even though it would be beneficial for you if you did. It would be beneficial if they just stood up and said the same thing over and over again until you got it, and until you did it, 
And then once you're all doing it, you'd, you'd, when they started again, you'd say, look, I've taken a poll. We're all doing this. Let's move on. Let's do the next thing. <clears throat> and then you move on. If you did that, you'd grow so much faster. Amen? Instead of always just hearing something new. <clears throat> that idea of always hearing something new is where most error and false doctrine and wrong teaching comes from, which ends up putting you in bondage instead of freeing you. Amen? Do you get that? So, now, <clears throat> notice, according to Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Galatians, chapter 6, verses 15, what is the only thing that counts? The new man. Now, if that's the only thing that counts, why is that really the only thing that most people have never studied? Why is it that that's the one thing? We've talked about it. We talk about getting born again. We tell you how to get there, but yet they don't tell you what it did for you when you got there. You know, oh, uh, with it comes healing. With it comes blessing. You know, it, that's a sales pitch. You know, get it so that once you get it, you can be healed. Once you get it, you can be freed. Once you get it. Uh, God will bless you. It's a sales pitch. <clears throat> Jesus said in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, he said that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel right, to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And I've said over and over again, we've heard the gospel offered, but we've very seldom have we actually heard it proclaimed. And the good news or the proclamation of the good news is very simple. You have been healed. Jesus has paid the price. You have been set free. You have been delivered. It's done. It is settled. It's a fact. All you have to do is decide not to live the way you did before. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight, right? Because your biggest enemy is not the devil. Your biggest enemy is you, right? Your biggest enemy is your unrenewed mind. Because do you realize, that people say, well, you know, the devil is our enemy. He is an enemy. That's why he's called devil. It means adversary. He is an enemy. But he's not your biggest enemy. Because he couldn't even stop you from walking out on him when he owned you. So he obviously can't be your biggest problem. He is really pretty easily beaten. Right? <clears throat> do you know what beats the devil? You making a decision. That's how easy it is to beat the devil. You want to be free from sickness and disease? Make a decision. Make a decision. I will never be sick another day in my life. Make that decision. You say, oh, I wouldn't want to say that because, you know, then sickness is going to come on you. Well, if you believe that, guess what? You get what you believe. Don't believe that. All right? Believe you're going to walk in divine health. Believe you're going to walk in freedom. You say, well, there's got to be more to it than that. No, believing is the key. It's believing. Isn't that what Jesus said? Only believe. All right? Jesus said, only believe. Right? Now, the Roman centurion said, speak the word only. In other words, well, you know, if you just take that, now this is, and listen carefully. If you take what the Roman centurion said of speak the word only, and you just pull that sentence out, what are you doing? You're taking it out of context, right? But it's still a good principle to only speak the word, right? Now, that's not the context, and that's not what he's saying, because the Roman centurion wasn't talking about the word of God, per se. He was just saying, if you would just speak a word of healing to my servant, if you would just say the word, my servant will be healed. So he wasn't talking about preaching the gospel. But it is a good idea to preach and only speak the word of God. Amen? That's part of renewing your mind. Part of renewing your mind is the discipline to not say anything that goes against the word of God. Do you realize that's a weapon? It's a weapon to keep your mouth shut think about that. When you keep your mouth shut, you're using a weapon. <clears throat> Paul said in Corinthians that our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? And even the casting down of imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, right? So anytime you are casting down anything, not going along with anything that goes against the word of God, that's a weapon. And it's a spiritual weapon, not a carnal, physical, natural weapon. So sometimes the best thing you can do is shut your mouth. Right? Because we all want to be agreeable. We all want to go along with people and, you know, agree with them. And the, the enemy will use that against you. He'll try to get someone that you don't even know to say something 
and you don't want to be disagreeable and you'll agree with them and you know it's against the Bible. You know, one of the main places I've seen that kind of thing try to happen is in grocery stores and you know, department stores and when people are just trying to make small talk and they'll say things and you know, for instance, like at a Kmart or something like that to where they have all the stuff along the, you know, right there where you're checking out all the impulse buying. <clears throat> and they'll say things like, well, now, did you get your flu medicine? Because, you know, it's the flu season and, you know, it's coming. You know, and, and instead of you taking that opportunity to say something about it, you, you, you just kind of want to get out of there. You know, you're, you're in a hurry and you, you, you don't want to take time to preach and the people in the line behind you, they don't want you to take time to preach either. They want you to move along, Right? <clears throat> but you don't want to go along with it and go, yeah, no, you don't want to. No, you can't just let it go. It can't just be neutral. It, it, you know, now, if you're, gonna, if you're not going to correct it, at least keep your mouth shut. You know? Jesus was a master at ignoring people's comments. <laughs> it's amazing. You know? For some reason, we think that if somebody asks us something, we've got to answer. If they ask us a quote, we've got to give them. And the Bible says, give an answer for, you know, to every man of the hope that lies within you. But that's talking about people asking you about this hope that lies within you. It's not talking about just, just average everyday questions. Many times, <clears throat> Jesus would just totally ignore people. And then, do you know the funny thing is? He would ignore people and answer things. Look at that sometimes. Go in and read about the fig tree. He answered it. The fig tree didn't talk to him, but yes, it did, because he answered. How did the fig tree talk? Well, it didn't speak, but it was saying something by not producing the figs. So he answered it. That was, it said, you know, it made a statement, so to speak, to him, and he answered it by saying, no man will eat fruit of you hereafter forever. So the fig tree said, well, that means I can't ever produce fruit, so I guess I might as well die. Jesus didn't say, Jesus didn't like using the word die. He didn't like using the word death. He didn't even, he, he did everything he could, he could to not say death. Even when the girl was dead, he came in and said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. And they all laughed at him. When, when Lazarus, they, he was several days off, two days off actually. And they said, you know, Lazarus, your friend is sick. You know, you got to come right away. And he stayed there another two days. And they said, well, you know, are we going to go? He said, no. And they said, he, he said, he sleeps. Oh, well, if he sleeps, he'll be okay. No, and he, it's, it's like they forced him to go, he's dead. But you don't ever see Jesus really using the word death. It's amazing. You know why? Because he, what he said came to pass. You know, that's why when you look at Ephesians chapter 1, we're right there. Just look across the page, right? Look right across the page, Ephesians chapter 1, and look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, that's a past tense word, so this is something that's already done. That means you can't mess it up. Right? If it's already done, you can't mess it up. Right? You need to think about that. If it's already done, you can't mess it up. He said, Who hath blessed us with all. Now, is, if the word all is all, it means all. It means that there's none left over. Right? So is there any blessing that you don't have? I mean, no, why? Because he's already blessed you with all, right? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places, right? In Christ. So you, you, he already has blessed you. You have that blessing, amen? So that's already done. So whenever you realize that it's already past tense and you are blessed, you know, if you go back into the original Greek and read that, it's real simple. All that says, and the way, even the way it's worded in the Greek is amazing, it says, it literally says this. When it says the word blessed, it says, God has said every good thing about you, he can say. That's what the word blessed means, right? And he says if he's blessed you with every spiritual blessing, he has blessed you, he has said every good thing about you, he can say. Now the good thing is when God says things, they come to pass, Right? So if God has blessed you, if he has spoken, well, what, what are some of the spiritual blessings that God has spoken over you? By his stripes, you were healed. That's a spiritual blessing. He blessed you with healing. Past tense, by his stripes, you were healed. Well, if I was, when was I healed? Well, 2,000 years ago, you were healed. 
that's when it took place. You know, until the, um, the quantum physics, uh, the, the science of quantum physics started being more and more uh, understood, f Christians had a hard time explaining faith. But once science started using those words, all of a sudden it gave Christians a way to look at faith and understand things. We talk about God. We look at God, and God is not within time. He's outside of time. Right? That's why he is I am. Because he's outside of time. So time doesn't register to him. I mean, it doesn't matter to him. Right? He knows the end from the beginning. He's, he, he can look at your life, and it's like looking at a parade. He can see you born. He can see you growing up. He can see your end. He can see it all at one time. Right? Like watching a parade. And because of that, <clears throat> when you think of this, <clears throat> it gets pretty amazing because the only way to explain that is through quantum, quantum physics. See, in quantum physics, everything, and they'll tell you this, in quantum physics, there is no set reality. Reality is anything that's possible. Well, when, did, when have you heard words like everything is possible? or anything is possible, or all things are possible. That's Bible, right? And now scientists are starting to use those terms, right? And they'll tell you, we can't even pinpoint some things, you know? It could be when they look at the electrons and the protons, and say, hey, well, we don't even know where those things are. We can give you an idea where they could be. But we can't, because of the speed, we can't even look at them and tell you where they are. We can just tell you where they'll be somewhere along this path. The amazing thing is, when they start looking for it, wherever they look, that's where they see it. You know why? Because <clears throat> that's where they're looking. Your expectation produces the reality. You hear that? Now, think about this. I have this actually written down here. <clears throat> I think it is. Let me see here. I had it written down here somewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> it's on page five of the manual you don't have. <clears throat> at the very top it says reality and then it has a line that says perceived your perception is your reality <clears throat> you say oh no that, that's, that's not true oh yeah it is your, now listen I did not say it was truth see truth is finite truth is, is set truth is All right. truth doesn't become truth is and for it to be truth it has to always be is Right? Just like God is God because he is I am. And because he is I am, he always is. Right? You get that? So for truth to be truth, truth has to be constant. That means for truth to be truth, there can be no time when truth is not truth. Right? I know this sounds... <laughs> you just, it's, it's, not, it's really simple, but if you listen to it, it sounds kind of you know, confusing. <clears throat> but for it, thy word is truth. Forever, O Lord, in Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. Right? Why? Because thy word is truth. His word is truth, and it's settled forever. Why is it, how, why is it settled forever? Because it's truth. Truth is forever. There's no time when truth isn't truth. Right? So if truth is always truth, then the scriptures say that by his stripes you were healed. So that was a fact then, it's a fact now. It'll always be a fact. Whether you walk in or not, it'll always be a fact. So at some point, all you, it's kind of like walking alongside railroad tracks. You can walk alongside them all your life, or at some point, you can actually jump on a train and take a ride off on down the road. Right? It's better to get on the train. Amen? See, once you, you start to realize this, now, <clears throat> when you look at, at your reality, your reality can be different than somebody else's reality. Because reality is not truth. See? God wants us to all get in line with truth. Why? Because thy word is truth. We get in line with truth, we get in line with his word. There's no truth outside of God's word. You hear that? Because if there was truth outside of God's word, then there would be other ways to get saved. Right? Now, if someone, let me, let me prove to you that your perception is your reality. <clears throat> you could, I don't know, let's, let's just, some theoretical situation but let's say you've got a relative that is going to get married. And someone comes to you and says, maybe they said, what's the name that, that you know, our cousin's going to marry? What's, what's the guy's name? What is his name? Well, his name is this. And they give you that name. You go, that's what I thought. Man, 
You know, I was going through criminal records the other day, and I, I saw that name. I thought that was his name. And you, it's the same birth date. Do, do, you, do you think that could be him? Well, you know, <clears throat> it said that, you know, he was wanted for this or that kind of thing. It had something to do with finances. And, you know, I think I remember her saying that he was involved in finances. And all, now, do you realize what you're doing? You're creating a perception. Now, the amazing thing is, your perception will create the reality of how you treat him when you meet him. And yet it could be somebody totally different, you know, two people, same name, totally different coincidence, right? It could be something like that, and yet by the time you meet this person, you could totally dislike them or totally distrust them. And depending on how fake you can be, they may know or may not know whether you like them or not, right? But it, you could have this whole idea built up in your head, and that that perception will create the reality of how you treat that person. Is that right? And yet that person could be just as innocent of that, you know, or it could be, you know, identity theft. Maybe this bad guy is using this person's identity, which makes it really hard not to prove that, it's, that it is that person. But now, see, that's, that's a perception that creates a reality. But truth just is. Right? And, and, but the, the amazing thing is, once you find truth, it creates its own reality. But the reality it creates is truth. Amen? So if thy word is truth, and he said, by his stripes you were healed, then what is truth? You're healed. Right? Now, if you look at that and decide to agree with that, and I can tell you different ways to do this, some of it's by confessing it and saying it and saying it out loud and dwelling upon it and meditating upon it. There's all these different ways. <clears throat> but if you do that, your dwelling upon the truth will cause the, the reality of your body being sick to come into alignment with truth. And the reality will change. How many of you know your reality can change? Right? You don't believe your reality can change? Look at some old photographs. <laughs> right? Your reality has changed over the years. Isn't that right? Why? But at the time that you looked, it was a reality. At the time they took the picture, that's a reality, right? But your reality changes. Well, the more you focus on the truth, the more your reality changes to line up with the truth. And there is so many things. When I was in um, South Africa, I guess last year or sometime, I actually taught a session, and we have it on CD now, and I think it's on MP3 and all that stuff on our website, but it there is a, a teaching I did that was called Becoming Instrument Rated. <clears throat> if you're going to be a pilot, there's two types of pilots, right? You can be instrument rated or you can fly by sight. Now, if you're going to fly by sight, there is a lot of limitations. You know, if it's bad weather, they won't let you fly. If it's distance or if you cannot, matter of fact, you cannot go so high up or, or to a certain uh, altitude because you will lose land mass and you won't be able to make uh, you know, good decisions based on where you are based on your line of sight. But if you're going to ever be responsible for carrying other people in, in an airplane, if you're going to become responsible and be a, what, what we generally call a commercial pilot, and you become responsible for other people's lives, then you're going to have to go through a course that teaches you how to fly by instrument. Now, once you fly by instrument, you don't even need to look out the window. You're watching the gauges. And, and you don't even look out there. You don't need any reference points. You don't need any of that. You have a radar system. You have the, the altimeter. You have all these different gauges to watch. And you can, they could completely close off the cockpit windows. And you could just look at those gauges, and you could look at a map and say, here's where we are right here because I'm watching these gauges. Why? Because you have become instrument rated. Now, once you're instrument rated, you no longer go by sight. The instruments tell you everything. It tells you what to do and when to do and how to do it. Well, <clears throat> as Christians, we do not walk or fly by sight. Amen? We walk by faith. What, are, what is the instruments of our faith? It's this book. This is your instruments. At some point, you're going to have to become instrument rated where you will go by this rather than by your sight. 
you're going to have to look at this, and because this tells you where you are, you believe this, and you don't look up and go. Because if you're flying in an airplane, you can actually lose your bearings, and you can be flying upside down or at an angle and not even tell it. And you would think, well, if I'm flying at an angle, I can tell it. No, but when you get high enough up, gravity starts losing some of its pull, and things change, and you get disoriented. And when you get disoriented, then you could actually fly into a mountain thinking that you're in the right place at the right time, and you'll be totally off, off the map, off the charts, off the radar. But if you're instrument rated, that won't happen because you're not even looking, and you can't, your eyes can't lie to you. You start looking at what the Word of God says, and you start reading it because this is the reality. This is the truth, and you become instrument rated rather than flying by sight. Amen? See, everything about this is about the Word of God. It goes back. You're going to have to decide what you're going to believe. You're going to have to decide whose report you're going to believe. See, I can talk to you in King James terms, or I can bring it into kind of modern you know, usage, so to speak. But bottom line, it's all going to come down to the same thing. At some point, you're going to have to decide to make a decision to go by the Word of God as opposed to what people tell you, what you hear, and what you see, and what you feel. And if you will do that, then you will be walking by faith, which is the only way to please God. Amen? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So, let's look at these scriptures. <clears throat> we had, um, <clears throat> there's several I'm just going to read through you. I'll give you, the, I'll give you the references, but I want to show you that God is not, a, he's not against knowledge. Okay? He's against earthly knowledge in the sense that it is devilish and does not take into account God's knowledge. Now, he says here, watch, and in, in, uh, I'll just read a couple of them to you real quick here. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Right? And it says it's going to happen in the end. Now, we know we're closer to the end than Daniel was, <clears throat> and we see knowledge... You know, used to knowledge doubled every 500 years. Then it dropped down to 100 years and 50 years. And even in the, in the last 50 years, it has dropped down to where now knowledge increases every six months. Doubles every six months. We were laughing about it the other day. I was, um, we were looking at phones up in Seattle. <clears throat> and one phone, it, was, it had a, uh, this new Samsung Galaxy tablet, right? Not the phone, but the actual tablet. It's kind of like the iPad, <clears throat> but smaller. And in the side, they have the SD card. And this little micro SD card has 16 gigs on it. Now, you can get them up to 32 gigs. And we were laughing about these things because my first computer didn't have 32. I'm talking about a whole machine didn't have 32 gigs of memory in it. <clears throat> and now they can put it on something that's smaller than my fingernail. Why? Because as knowledge increases, things can get smaller. And they keep making it smaller and smaller. And now they're actually, well, they say they're on the verge. Personally, I think they've probably already done it because they never tell you what, what they're doing. They tell you what they did five years ago, ten years ago. You know, remember back in the old days in the 60s and the 70s and you watched Star Trek and they had their personal communicators. Remember, we call them cell phones, right? It's the same thing. They were already working on them back then. And we had the same thing, you know. And now they got them on watches, that you can, you know, like Dick Tracy, remember the, and that was back in the 30s and 40s. You know, Dick Tracy had a, you know, phone watch. And we got the same thing now. And so you can see what they're, what they're working on. But they're saying that now even they are bypassing the electronics. And now it is literally artificial intelligence. It's this thing, it's almost like a living organism to where this thing is traveling and it's not anywhere. It's, it's hovering between it. Right Now think about that, because that's what's allowing these things to, to trade. I remember when I bought a, my first extension or external hard drive you know, to plug into your computer. And man, man, what was it then? I think, uh, I think 100, and tw 100 gig, 120 gig. Man, that was just phenomenal. You know? And just the other day, I bought, I bought a two terabyte for $79. Two terabytes. That's huge. I mean, that's a, you know, and it was this big, you know. I can, I care, actually, I brought it with me. It's in a little zipper pouch. 
That's phenomenal. You know, back in the back in the day, you know, NASA didn't have a two terabyte thing that big. You know what I'm saying? And now you can buy them on the shelf at you know your local Kmart. So it just shows how things are, are moving forward. Now, in Hosea 4:6, it says, and everybody knows this one. <clears throat> it's kind of like if you ask people about healing, everybody knows Paul's thorn. They know Timothy's stomach. They know they know every failure and every reason why not. All right, and everybody knows this verse. All right. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Right? Well, that's a fact. But now notice what it says. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you. So he wasn't saying, look, you're just being destroyed because you don't have the knowledge. He's saying the knowledge was available and you rejected it. And if you reject the remedy, guess what's going to happen? He said, I don't want you destroyed. But if you reject the remedy, I can't help you. Well, it's the same thing with Jesus. If you reject Jesus... He's the remedy. God doesn't have a plan B. Right? And once we realize that, see the, the Eastern religions and New Age religions, which are basically one and the same thing, just, you know, fancied up. But these other <clears throat> false religions, they all go back to the same thing. And they're all trying to say there's other ways. And that whole idea has crept into the church to the point where now we have, you know, moral relativism, we have uh, situational ethics, you know. Well, that's right for you, but not for me. Well, this is truth for you, but not for me. No, that can't be. If it's truth, it always is, right? You can't, there can't be truth that's right for you and not right for me. Truth is truth. And if God doesn't have a plan B, well, let me back up. If, if this idea has crept into the church to the point where there may be a plan B, then guess the first effect it's going to have. People aren't going to care. They're not really going to be adamant about getting people born again through Jesus. We're going to start slacking off on that because, well, you know, maybe there's other ways. And then you have some world-famous evangelists get on television and not want to say Jesus is the only way to the Father. You see, that? if, if the, if the world-famous evangelists are not going to do that, then the church is already in trouble. Amen? But if you get a hold of this and you start realizing there is only one way, then all of a sudden, the emphasis again is to go back to getting people born again. See, that's what we've lost. And we can see this in the church. The church has lost the idea of that. Now, we're about gifts. We're about anointings. We're about fads. We're about whatever's coming up. But pin somebody down, you know, to say, do you or do you not believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord? Well, I believe he existed. Well, so did all the people that lived during his day. And they didn't all get saved. That's not the point. Well, you know, I, I believe he was a good teacher. No, that's not good. Look, Jesus was either Lord or he's a liar. You know? Or in the words of, uh, what's it, Josh McDowell. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. Because Jesus didn't just say, I'm a good teacher. He said, I am the way. Right? He didn't even come to show you the way. He is the way. Amen? So these are things that we're going to have to get back to. This Understanding this new man and what takes place, it should have the effect on the church that it's, it starts to make you realize how important it is to get this new birth into every person. See, I'll be very honest. In the past, we have focused on healing because the church has been so sick. And now we have people, they got a hold of the divine healing technician training. It's, it's truth. It's Bible. Simple as that. It works. People are doing it. <clears throat> Believers are going out in the streets. It's happening all over the world. It's more than just a, you know, a seminar. It is literally, as we got an email, my daughter got an email today, it is a revolution. It is changing Christianity. It is causing the people, the average Christians, to realize God can use me. And it's not just a, well, when I feel his presence. It is a fact that you can do it anytime, anywhere, for anybody in the mall, in the church, or anywhere else. And because of that, it's creating literally a revolution. <clears throat> now, the last part of this is very simple. We've taught on healing. But healing is the calling card because people were sick. But as I told you all along, even in the DHT, it's not about healing. It's about knowing who you are. It's, we heal because of who we are, because of who lives in us, not because we know the right doctrine. Amen? And so now, as 
and the problem has been is that we've so focused sometimes on signs and wonders, which is what people are drawn to, which is always good, that we have not emphasized this new birth, which is the greatest sign and wonder. Amen? Because, you know, you, there's a lot, of, a lot of ways people can get healed. But when you get down to it, people can't argue with a changed life. Especially when that person says, this is how it happened. Amen? Take a break.